Hey guys, it's Traylon and I'm here today with another episode of Recent Reads. This is the series where I just chat about the last 10 books that I read. I always like to put a little disclaimer. How I feel about a book and especially the numerical rating I give it is not only subjective but ultimately somewhat pointless because books were not written to appeal to me. I'm just talking about how I personally felt about it and even though I do talk about craft and things I thought were well done or not well done, again that is so subjective. My feelings on a book don't invalidate other people's feelings on a book. The first book that I read is a book that I I am so excited to talk about and it's Brad by Sophie Crocker. So full disclosure, <laughs> Sophie is one of my closest friends. Um, you may remember them from How to Write a Poem as well as a recent like podcast style writing chat that we did. You know when your friends are so amazingly, jaw-droppingly, beautifully talented that you just live for the day that the world can see how beautifully draw droppingly talented they are and then the day finally arrives and their book comes out and it's like now the world can see what I know to be true. This collection is chaotic and feral and mythic and funny. Sophie has such an original poetic voice that is so unbelievably original and coyly self-aware. These poems are electric and fierce. There's so much energy and so much life to these poems, yet among that are like these really like monumentally small observations about the world and life that are so illuminating. They have a remarkable ability to make chaos from order and order from chaos. It's just pure entropy and it's beautiful. It's so good. It's so good. I'm so proud of them. Having been there to like see them work on this and know like how much heart they put into every poem. It's such a ferocious but also tender, tender little book that I treasure. So then I read Cult Classic by Sloane Crosley. I read this for a book club with some co-workers. So this book is about a woman who I don't remember her name and she's just like wandering around New York and she starts running into all of her exes. This did not work for me. Uh, it didn't really work for anyone in my book club. We follow this woman who starts running into all of her exes but I didn't find a single one of the exes or relationships interesting. And so it was just so dull. Like the narrator was interesting on a line level. Like the individual sentences are pop but as a whole person there was nothing about her that I was invested in. There was no journey in this book that I was invested in. Part of the reason why I didn't care at all is because this book is about her finding closure for past relationships but she literally hates all of her exes. She's so bitter she hates everyone and so it's like what closure is there to find? You don't care about these people. You aren't invested in moving on. You aren't invested in these people. You aren't invested in these relationships. So why should I care about you moving on from them? There's a surrealist twist revealed a third way through, which to me completely ruined the mystery and the intrigue of the situation. Really the only interesting thing in the first third is you keep ask is you're asking like why is she running into all of her exes? There must be something going on and then it's revealed a third through and from then on you know what's going on. If you're not invested in her journey of like reconciling with these old relationships then there's nothing to care about at that point. I just honestly wasn't invested in a single thing in this book. All the exes blur together. I have to talk about the ending because as I was reading I was like there's one thing that could slightly redeem this book for me. It ends in this way and then it literally ended in the worst way possible. Skip to this timestamp if you don't want spoilers but in the end basically she just figures out that the man she's truly loved all along is her fiance and we're supposed to be like happy for them but she treats him so badly. Like you are a serial monogamist who hates everyone that you date. Why should I be happy that now you've decided that oh this is the one you've actually loved all along even though you treated him terribly? Girl what you need is to take some time for, to, for yourself. Like you need to give up dating for a bit. You need to go to therapy and like be alone. And so I felt like this book had no self-awareness for what the main character needed because we have this miserable person who hates everyone that she interacts with but also needs to be in a relationship and in the end the thing that makes her happy is being in a relationship. Anyways, I give this two stars because the quality of the writing isn't awful and there are ideas in it that are really cool. So then I read uh, Post Traumatic by Chantal V. Johnson, kind of like, you know, like aimless millennial woman fiction, which is personally one of my favorite subgenres. We follow the main character Vivian. She's a successful lawyer. She works in a psych hospital trying to get patients who've been 
admitted against their will to psych wards, trying to get them out of psych wards. She's very successful. She's also miserable. <laughs> she has a lot of very unresolved childhood trauma. She has a very severe eating disorder. She's extremely judgmental of everyone around her because she has no security in herself and she's very tumultuous family relationships. I think I thought that this would be a bit funnier and lighter than it was, I'll be honest. I do think that publishing needs to stop marketing books that are about trigger warning, sexual abuse as like funny, dark humor, funny books. Like honestly, this book was marketed, in my opinion, based on the back jacket, poorly marketed. Anyways, I kind of just say that as a warning just because I don't feel like from reading the back jacket, you actually really get a sense of the topics that this book deals with and how, how heavy this book is. I kind of realized something about this book that I feel like I've seen in other books and it was only this book that could make me like put into words what this quality is. This book is written in this type of third person where the narrative feels aware that the character is a character and isn't trying to write them as if they were a realistic person, but is almost like writing them aware that they are a character. Not that they, they feel less complex and that's not a criticism. The character feels very complex and well rendered, but it's like the book knows that she's a character and we're looking at her to dissect her almost as like a literary topic in some ways. But it's not like there's a lack of empathy for her or a lack of complexity for her. It's just the specific tone that the narrative has towards the character. There's a little separation there. There's like a self-awareness there that is very interesting. This isn't a bad thing. I actually really enjoyed that. I find that quite interesting. The beginning of this book feels pretty stagnant. Like it's a very self-aware depiction of a woman with deeply unprocessed traumas. And she's kind of just cycling through various relationships that she has and it doesn't really feel like it's going anywhere. However, towards the end, she genuinely starts to heal and it's like really actually really moving and it's very believable. And these moments where this hyper judgmental character who has built up this hyper judgmental persona to kind of, you know, repress and cope with her traumas, the moments where she starts to see like beauty in small things are touching. And when those walls come down, it's it's very well earned and it's very touching. As this switches from being a novel about trauma to being a novel about healing, it becomes very impactful. But that doesn't happen until about two thirds in. It finds its emotional core and the emotional core is actually like very impactful, I think. So it took me a long time to feel movement here. Like it felt like for a long time, I was just with an, a, an interesting character in stasis. And then when she, there started to be movement, I was, it was actually quite touching. It just took a while to get there. So then I read some fantasy. I've been trying to read more fantasy. However, the problem is that I have very particular tastes in fantasy and that I want it to be short and a standalone and also gay. I'm short on options. I found this book which felt like everything that I wanted and that is a queer fantasy standalone and it's pretty short and it's The Bruising of Kilwa by Nassim Jamnia. This book is set in this city called Kilwa and there's this like bizarre plague happening. We follow the main character working with some others in like a found family kind of situation using medicinal blood magic basically to try and cure this plague. Very interesting magic and world. I think it's just it's too much story packed into too few pages. This is only 180 pages. It's funny because I feel like a hypocrite because I picked this up because it was short but I do think that if this was 400 pages then it would have it would have had room for both world building and character development, but it felt like there wasn't enough space for both. And so the book had to pick character development or world building and it picked world building, which was really interesting. The characters are able to like reach into another person's blood to like heal them. It's very cool. And the way it's described is like so visceral. I think sometimes the stakes feel a bit meddled because I think the story, the book is struggling to balance its micro and its macro storylines. I was always confused about what was going on with the macro storyline and the politics and everything. Like I knew that there was some kind of like colonialism happening or xen and xenophobia, but I could never keep track of like the different groups and their relationships to each other and like everything going on in the macro storyline. I think this is a novella that if it was like 400 pages, I would have had room for all of that stuff. I do love a book, a fantasy book that in some ways is like a queer utopia. I did have questions about gender, how gender worked in this world because the main character is non-binary and there are a lot of trans or non-binary characters and they even have a way like when you introduce yourself, you're like pronouns are like part of the way you introduce yourself. It's very cool. But I kind of didn't understand like the framework of gender in this world. They have such a fluid view of gender, but it's never really explained how people view gender. All we know is if you're trans or non-binary, that is accepted completely. And you know, they use the blood magic to do like gender affirming surgery and stuff. I don't actually really understand how people view gender or how this society views gender or how it views gender roles or anything like that. So that felt like a bit of a missed opportunity, I think, to bake 
the way we were seeing gender in our characters into the world building. I wanted to understand that. Not that I was like, I think tra trans people should be discriminated against, but it's more just like, what is gender in this world? What is gender to, to this culture? If they view gender in such a fluid way, what does that word mean to them? And I have no sense of that really. All I have a sense for is, this is what the characters identify as and these are their pronouns. I'm not trying to like say it was, it's, it's not like it was bad representation or anything. I loved seeing a non-binary character in fantasy. I think it's more than just like that stuff really excites me. And so I would have liked it to go deeper because I think it asked, it asked questions that weren't answered that I would have loved answers to. When you write queer fantasy, you have the opportunity to not write queer characters, but to explore a queer world. I didn't understand how that really worked. So then I read a short story collection, What We Fed to the Manticore by Talia Lakshmi Kaluri. I was so intrigued by this collection from the moment that I heard about it. This is a short story collection where every story is from an animal POV and they're all different animals. This was really vivid, super memorable. Every story is really unique and memorable. Each story is just like very intentionally put together, very cleverly, distinctly put together. I do think some stories though do a better deeper job of engaging with the limits of their animal POV. In some stories, the animals can understand and actually even converse with humans. But in a lot of stories, and it's not consistent, the animals will have understanding of human things and human constructs that they just simply would have no way to understand. In like the story about a wolf, and the story about a whale, these are two different stories. In the wolf story, the wolf is unfamiliar with what a gun is and what a truck is, and so has to describe it in its own terms. And in the whale story, the whale doesn't know what a boat is and is you know, distressed by the sound of a boat engine because they don't know what a boat is. But then in the final story, which is about a pigeon, the bird knows what a hospital it is and they get injured and they end up in a bird hospital and they know where they are. Describe all these human, pieces of technology that I'm like, a bird would have no idea what that is. I just opened to a random page in this final story. Again, the noise of a station, a change in the quality of the air, the mechanical noises of metal hitting metal as trains slid into the station, swallowed a stream of passengers and pushed their way out again. How does the bird know what a train station is? How does the bird know what a train is? I think the fun of an animal POV is the way that that perspective limits a story's well of knowledge, right? And so the story has to get more creative in describing things from this perspective. I think a book like this is most interesting when we see what animals don't understand about humanity from their own perspectives, not when it's basically just a human mind in an animal body, which is what some of these stories were. And I did still enjoy the stories, but I just felt like if they'd gone deeper into the limits of the POV, they would have shone more. I think the stories that are the strongest in this collection are the ones that maybe engage with human constructs, but explain them through an animal's terms. Like that first story about the donkey is about like war and like occupation, but it's from an animal's perspective. And because it's from an animal's perspective, it just really highlights how unjust this is. This is just an animal who doesn't understand what's going on and he doesn't understand what these things are. His confusion, it really highlights how unjust and how wrong this is, right? And I think the strongest stories are the ones that can engage with problems that humans have caused. The animal's confusion in relation to that thing is what highlights how messed up it is. I think the stories that don't really engage as deeply with the animal POV and basically just treat them as little humans in like a different body, I don't think are as strong. So then I read Uzumaki by Junji Ida. You guys have been commenting on this for ages. It was in my TBR pile and people have been like, is that Uzumaki? Cause it, it's pretty clear. This is a horror manga, pretty wild. Basically it's about a town that starts getting like infested with spirals. There's some wild imagery that is like really disturbing, but like hypnotic, it's freaky. Unlike uh, Ram Ramina, which is the other like full length story that I've read by Junji Ito, that one I thought was just too quick paced and there was so much stuff that I wish it had like just taken its time on more. This really gives its time to the story and it feels episodic at first and then all the episodes start to weave together. It's very cool. I kind of see why this is considered his magnum opus. It definitely has like a wow factor to it. Very entertaining, very visually impactful, very creative storytelling. So then I read Son of Sin by Omer Sacker. It's like a family saga, but it's told from this perspective of this one son named Jamal who doesn't really know a lot of his family ties. He has a very fractured heritage, family spread all over the world. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining it because it's a lot of just like very subtle family connections kind of. Interesting setup, slightly underwhelming execution for me. I think that there were a lot of relationships that all had heat to them, 
but none really took center stage and like made something of the potential that they had. There's several parts and to me it almost felt like the most interesting stuff happened in the time skips. Like we would catch up after a time skip and like a bunch of stuff has happened. And I was like, that that feels more interesting than the stuff that we saw. Like, why couldn't we see that part of the story? What this needed, because I do think that there's some really interesting relationships set up here, an interesting character with a lot of internal conflict. For me, what this just needed was something to be the glue, be the unifying factor. Whether that was a single relationship, a mood, a place, something to just magnetize everything. But I think it was just too scattered. The pieces didn't really fit together, even though the pieces on their own were really interesting. So I never really got the sense of like, I know what narrative I'm reading and I'm interested to see how the narrative evolves. It was more just like, oh yeah, that's an interesting thing, but they, they weren't really like working together. So to close this off, I have three novellas. So the first one here is The Family That Carried Their House On Their Back. Um, by Sammy Dowing. It's basically it's set in a world where women carry their houses, their family's home on their back and men have the keys to those houses. Definitely some really beautiful writing, really beautiful imagery in here. I think I just struggled to connect with this because I couldn't really picture the, the magical elements. Like I just needed clearer visuals. And I don't know, a lot of stuff just kind of happened out of nowhere or without much setup. From a mood perspective, this was really interesting. This weird like feral mythic kind of vibe that it had. But I think I just wish that it could have solidified itself more at certain points, solidified how things worked and what the pieces of this narrative were because I never really felt like I was getting payoff for anything. I don't really know. I read this in like one sitting, so I don't really have much to say about it because I uh, don't really remember. Sorry, that seems so mean. Then I read another fantasy book, When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain by Nevo. This is the second book in the Singing Hills trilogy. The first one is The Empress of Salt and Fortune, which I really, really enjoyed. Read that earlier this year. I was really excited to read this one. So this series um, is told from the lens of a cleric who is telling or recording these different stories. And the story that they're recording in this book is about the relationship between this infamous woman tiger warrior and her her lover who is a scholar. These stories are very lyrical, very mythic, very unique world building. I would say beautiful world building. Um, like some of the details that are chosen are just like beautiful. Like the world building itself is poetic, which is I think special to it. I think there's like two very compelling stories here, but the story about the cleric kind of takes away from the main story, which I think is the more interesting story a lot of space goes to the frame. There must only be like 50 pages of the actual narrative, right? About uh, the tiger woman, about the tiger warrior love story. She does so much with so little space in a way that not to shade all fantasy writers, but other fantasy writers could learn from. Even though I do wish there was a little more time to be given to that core relationship and a little more depth, that felt like a matter of just lack of space. Like she did as much as could be done in the space given. It wasn't a lack of craft, I don't think. I think it's just a lack of space. If there was just a little more space given, I think that then it would have just had the full depth. But she does a lot on each page. Had there just been more pages or more pages allotted to, to the story versus the frame, then this would have been even more chef's kiss. But already very delectable little fantasy novella. So the final book in this video is The Pachinko Parlor by Elisa Chouadusapin, translated by Anissa Higgins. You guys know I love Elisa Chouadusapin. I have a book a published book review of her debut, Winter and Sokcho, in the common. It was my favorite book of last year when I found out that she had another book coming out. Oh, this is about a woman who lives in Switzerland. Her grandparents are Korean. They live in Tokyo, so she's spending the summer in Tokyo with them, and she gets a job as a nanny. It's very subtle. You guys know Elisa Chouadusapin is my sad girl queen. She is my melancholic weird sad girl icon. This had her trademark like del delicate, specific, visceral, kind of dreamy but also like sharp, like languid but also kind of brisk quality. I don't know how she does it. She creates a very unique quality to her work that I love and is so immersive to me. I just think this didn't have the same level of heat in the interpersonal relationships that Winter and Sock Show did which is what made that book so special. Like the dynamics in that book are just very urgent and propulsive. This is a more uplifting story. As a result, there's not as much heat to the character dynamics. So if you are looking for a more uplifting story that's more about like close, touching, intimate, personal family connections, 
then this may be for you. I just like weird relationships and uneasy vibes. I liked Winter and, so Winter and Sauction more because it had that unease. There was like a, there's a discomfort to that book that I love, which is weird to be like, I like books that make me uncomfortable, but it, there's a discomfort that I, an uneasiness to that book, which is what made it special to me. Her writing is just as good. The relationships don't have the same pop the same urgency the same tension to them but i still am obsessed with her so that is all for this video guys thank you so much for watching as always i would love to hear what books you have been reading lately by the time i post this is probably pretty late in the year so if you want to tell me what your favorite book you read in 2022 was i would love to hear it i well i don't want to say yet because it's only the end of october as i'm filming this but my two favorites of the year so far have been Finn Egyptian Cannot Speak English by Nurnaga and When I'm Gone, Look For Me in the East by Kwan Berry. I don't think anything's gonna catch those two. So that's all for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.